The Everlasting Man by G. K. Chesterton Book Two, Chapter Four The Witness of the Heretics Christ founded the Church with two great figures of speech. In the final words to the apostles who received authority to found it, the first was the phase about founding it on Peter as on a rock, the second was the symbol of the keys. About the meaning of the former, there is naturally no doubt in my own case, but it does not directly affect the argument here save in two more secondary aspects. It is yet another example of a thing that could only fully expand and explain itself afterwards, and even long afterwards. And it is yet another example of something the very reverse of simple and self-evident, even in the language, in so far as it described a man as a rock, when he had much more the appearance of a reed. But the other image of the keys has an exactitude that has hardly been exactly noticed. The keys have been conspicuous enough in the art and heraldry of Christendom, but not everyone has noted the peculiar aptness of the allegory. We have now reached the point in history where something must be said of the first appearance and activities of the Church in the Roman Empire, and for that brief description nothing could be more perfect than that ancient metaphor. The early Christian was very precisely a person carrying about a key, or what he said was a key. The whole Christian movement consisted in claiming to possess that key. It was not merely a vague forward movement which might be better represented by a battering ram. It was not something that swept along with it similar or dissimilar things, as does a modern social movement. As we shall see in a moment, it rather definitely refused to do so. It definitely asserted that there was a key, and that it possessed that key, and that no other key was like it. In that sense it was as narrow as you please. Only it happened to be the key that could unlock the prison of the whole world, and let in the white daylight of liberty. The creed was like a key in three respects, which can be most conveniently summed up under this symbol. First, a key is above all things a thing with a shape. It is a thing that depends entirely upon keeping its shape. The Christian creed is above all things the philosophy of shapes and the enemy of shapelessness. That is where it differs from all that formless infinity, Manichaean or Buddhist, which makes a sort of pool of night in the dark heart of Asia the ideal of uncreating all the creatures. That is where it differs also from the analogous vagueness of mere evolutionism, the idea of creatures constantly losing their shape. A man told that his solitary latchkey had been melted down with a million others into a Buddhistic unity would be annoyed but a man told that his key was gradually growing and sprouting in his pocket, and branching into new wards or complications, would not be more gratified. Second, the shape of a key is in itself a rather fantastic shape. A savage who did not know it was a key would have the greatest difficulty in guessing what it could possibly be. And it is fantastic because it is, in a sense, arbitrary. A key is not a matter of ab abstractions. In that sense, a key is not a matter of argument. It either fits the lock or it does not. It is useless for men to stand disputing over it, considered by itself, or reconstructing it on pure principles of geometry or decorative art. It is senseless for a man to say he would like a simple key. It would be far more sensible to do his best with a crowbar. 
and thirdly, as the key is necessarily a thing with a pattern, so this was one having in some ways a rather elaborate pattern. When people complain of the religion being so early complicated with theology and things of the kind, they forget that the world had not only got into a hole, but had got into a whole maze of holes and corners. The problem itself was a complicated problem. It did not, in the ordinary sense, merely involve anything so simple as sin. It was also full of secrets, of unexplored and unfathomable fallacies, of unconscious mental diseases, of dangers in all directions. If the faith had faced the world only with the platitudes about peace and simplicity some moralists would confine it to, it would not have had the faintest effect on that luxurious and labyrinthine lunatic asylum. What it did do, we must now roughly describe. It is enough to say here that there was undoubtedly much about the key that seemed complex. Indeed, there was only one thing about it that was simple. It opened the door. There are certain recognized and accepted statements in this matter which may, for brevity and convenience, be described as lies. We have all heard people say that Christianity arose in an age of barbarism. They might just as well say that Christian science arose in an age of barbarism. They may think Christianity was a symptom of social decay, as I think Christian science a symptom them of mental decay. They may think Christianity a superstition that ultimately destroyed a civilization, as I think Christian science a superstition capable, if taken seriously, of destroying any number of civilizations. But to say that a Christian of the fourth or fifth centuries was a barbarian living in a barbarous time is exactly like saying that Mrs. Eddy was a Red Indian. And if I allowed my constitutional impatience with Mrs. Eddy to impel me to call her a Red Indian, I should, incidentally, be telling a lie. We may like or dislike the imperial civilization of Rome in the fourth century. We may like or dislike the industrial civilization of America in the nineteenth century. But that they both were what we commonly mean by a civilization, no person of common sense could deny if he wanted to. This is a very obvious fact, but it is also a very fundamental one, and we must make it the foundation of any further description of constructive Christianity in the past. For good or evil, it was preeminently the product of a civilized age perhaps of an over-civilized age. This is the first fact, apart from all praise or blame. Indeed, I am, not, I am so unfortunate as not to feel that I praise a thing when I compare it to Christian science. But it is at least desirable to know something of the savor of a society in which we are condemning or praising anything and the science that connects Mrs. Eddy with tomahawks, or the Mater Dolorosa with totems, may, for our general convenience, be eliminated. The dominant fact, not merely about the Christian religion, but about the whole pagan religion, but about the whole pagan civilization, was that which has been more than once repeated in these pages. The Mediterranean was a lake, in the real sense of a pool, in which a number of different cults or cultures were, as the phrase goes, pooled. Those cities facing each other round the circle of the lake became more and more one cosmopolitan culture. On its legal and military side it was the Roman Empire, but it was very many-sided. 
It might be called superstitious in the sense that it contained a great number of varied superstitions. But by no possibility can any part of it be called barbarous. In this level of cosmopolitan culture arose the Christian religion and the Catholic Church. And everything in the story suggests that it was felt to be something new and strange. Those who have tried to suggest that it evolved out of something much milder or more ordinary have found that in this case their evolutionary method is very difficult to apply. They may suggest that Essenes or Ebionites or such things were the seed, but the seed is invisible. The tree appears very rapidly full-grown, and the tree is something totally different. It is certainly a Christmas tree in the sense that it keeps the kindliness and moral beauty of the story of Bethlehem, but it was as ritualistic as the seven-branched candlestick, and the candle di candles it carried were considerably more than were probably permitted by the first prayer book of Edward the Sixth. It might well be asked, indeed, why anyone accepting the Bethlehem tradition should object to golden or gilded ornament, since the Magi themselves brought gold. Why he should dislike incense in the church, since incense was brought even to the stable. But these are controversies which do not concern me here. I am concerned only with the historical fact, more and more admitted by historians, that very early in its history this thing became visible to the civilization of antiquity, and that already the church appeared as a church, with everything that is implied in a church and much that is disliked in a church. We will discuss in a moment how far it was like other ritualistic or magical or ascetical mysteries in its own time. It was certainly not in the least like merely ethical and idealistic movements in our time. It had a doctrine, it had a discipline, it had sacraments, it had degrees of initiation, it admitted people and expelled people. It affirmed one dogma with authority and reputed another with anathemas. If all these things be the mark of Antichrist, the reign of Antichrist followed very rapidly upon Christ. Those who maintain that Christianity was not a church but a moral movement of idealists have been forced to push the period of its perversion or disappearance further and further back. A bishop of Rome writes claiming authority in the very lifetime of John the Evangelist and it is described as the first papal aggression. A friend of the apostles writes of them as men he knew, and said that they taught him the doctrine of the sacrament, and Mr. Wells can only murmur that the reaction towards barbaric blood rites may have happened rather earlier than might have been expected. The date of the fourth gospel which at one time was steadily growing later and later, is now steadily growing earlier and earlier, until critics are staggered at the dawning and dreadful possibility that it might be something like what it professes to be. The last limit of an early date for the extinction of true Christianity has probably been found by the latest German professor whose authority is invoked by Dean Ing. This learned scholar says that Pentecost was the occasion for the first founding of an ecclesiastical, dogmatic, and despotic church, utterly alien to the simple ideals of Jesus of Nazareth. This may be called, in a popular as well as a learned sense, the limit. What do professors of this kind imagine that men are made of? Suppose it were a matter of any merely human movement, let us say that of the conscientious objectors. Some say the early Christians were pacifists, 
I do not believe it for a moment, but I am quite ready to accept the parallel for the sake of the argument. Tolstoy, or some great preacher of peace among peasants, has been shot as a mutineer for defying conscription and a little while afterwards his few followers meet together in an upper room in remembrance of him. They never had any reason in coming together except that common memory. They are men of many kinds with nothing to bind them, except that the greatest event in all their lives was this tragedy of the teacher of universal peace. They are always repeating his words, revolving his problems, trying to imitate his character. The pacifists meet at their Pentecost, and are possessed of a sudden ecstasy of enthusiasm and wild rush of the whirlwind of inspiration, in the course of which they proceed to establish universal conscription, to increase the navy estimates, to insist on everybody going about armed to the teeth, and on all the frontiers bristling with artillery. The proceedings concluded with the singing of boys of the bulldog breed, and don't let them scrap the British Navy. That is something like a fair parallel to the theory of these critics. But the transition from their idea of Jesus to their idea of Catholicism could have been made in the little upper room at Pentecost. Surely anybody's common sense would tell him that enthusiasts who only met through their common enthusiasm for a leader whom they loved would not instantly rush away to establish everything that he hated. No, if the ecclesiastical and dogmatic system is as old as Pentecost, it is as old as Christmas. If we trace it back to such very early Christians, we must trace it back to Christ. We may begin, then, with these two negations. It is nonsense to say that the Christian faith appeared in a simple age, in the sense of an unlettered and ungullible age. It is equally nonsense to say that the Christian faith was a simple thing, in the sense of a vague or childish or merely instinctive thing. Perhaps the only point in which we could possibly say that the Church fitted into the pagan world is the fact that they were both not only highly civilized, but rather complicated. They were both emphatically many-sided. But antiquity was then a many-sided whole, like a hexagonal hole waiting for an equally hexagonal stopper. In that sense only, the church was many-sided enough to fit the world. The six sides of the Mediterranean world faced each other across the sea and waited for something that should look always at once. The church had to be both Roman and Greek and Jewish and African and Asiatic. In the very words of the Apostle of the Gentiles, it was indeed all things to all men. Christianity, then, was not merely crude and simple, and was the very reverse of the growth of a barbaric time. But when we come to the contrary charge, we come to a much more plausible charge. It is very much more tenable that the faith was but the final phase of the decay of civilization, in the sense of the excess of civilization, than that this superstition was a sign that Rome was dying, and dying of being much too civilized. That is an argument much better worth considering, and we will proceed to consider it. End of Part 1 of Chapter 4